Thanks for being here. Yes. My name is Kelly Kelleher. I am the Chief Quality and Safety Officer for Phoenix Children's, and I'm excited to get our eighth annual Quality Day started this year. Um, special thanks to Valleywise for allowing us to share this Ground Browns uh, slot with them that they typically host um, on, on this week. So thank you for allowing us to, to partner together. Um, we're really excited to celebrate all of the quality improvement efforts happening across our organization today. And that's what I hope comes across the most is that this is a true celebration of all of the work that we're doing across our enterprise. Um, we are taking the opportunity to celebrate uh, two efforts this morning um, that really highlight, you know, things that started locally, some have even spread nationally, but really are embedded in really strong quality improvement science. And I think you'll see the impact that they are making um, on the patients that they serve. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Tom Sitzman. Dr. Sitzman is a plastic surgeon at Phoenix Children's, uh, specializing in the care of children with cleft lip and cleft palate. His work spans the domains of clinical care, quality improvement, and clinical research. As part of Phoenix Children's Center for Cleft and Craniofacial Care, he has led efforts to implement uh, standardization outcome measurement across disciplines using quality improvement methods, which he is going to highlight for us today. Uh, he is also actively engaged in two NIH-funded multi-center studies, comparing the effectiveness of existing surgical techniques for children with cleft palate. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Sitzman to share his work and, and the work of his team. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Kelly, thanks for the introduction. Um, I thought I might take the next uh, 20 minutes or so and share some of uh, our experiences in the cleft and craniofacial center about using quality improvement methods to improve patient care. Um, and it's really a story of our cleft team's journey of continual improvement. And uh, maybe to make it a little more interesting, I'm gonna kind of break it down into three acts or three separate pieces. Um, that really tell the story. And I'll start with uh, Act One, which focuses on improving measurement of treatment outcomes. So uh, many of you may be familiar with cleft lip or cleft palate. Um, it's the second most common congenital anomaly after heart disease. Um, and about half the time it's diagnosed uh, prenatally and half the time uh, at birth. And these children undergo several surgeries in the first year of life, but then they follow with our team very closely, really until they're 18 or 20, to monitor the care we deliver and see if they need further surgery. And so it's really a, an 18 to 20 year progression of monitoring. And when it comes to measuring our outcomes, uh, we as a team realize that um, we had very inconsistent records. We were losing a lot of kids uh, in follow-up processes, and this left us unable to evaluate the care we were delivering. So we felt like we were doing a good job, but we were totally unable to know if that was the case. And yeah, what we wanted uh, instead was a system of consistent evaluations with consistent follow-up times uh, so that we could continuously monitor our care. And we sat down with this amazing team uh, of providers at this very large conference table, which still exists. Um, and we really hammered out what we wanted to measure. That was our first step. And we agreed that we wanted to measure the aesthetic outcomes of a cleft lip repair because how a lip looks is how a child interacts with society. And we do that with facial photographs. We wanted to look at the dental outcomes because almost all of these children are missing teeth or have severe occlusal problems and they're prone to cavities. So we wanted to look at that. And we also wanted to evaluate their speech because children with cleft palate are prone to a number of speech problems and treating those is a key part of what a cleft team delivers. And we chose very rigorous uh, and uh, well-accepted scales to measure each of these. And then we decided that we wanted to collect all of those things when children were five years old. And we chose that time point uh, really for three reasons. The first is it's the earliest time point at which you can get children to participate in all these things. And if you doubt that, try to get a three-year-old to hold still for a photo <laughs> um, or uh, to look in their mouth really well. 
Um, the other, the second reason is that uh, five years is when they start school. And so we really like to get kids primed and very similar to their peers uh, at the time of starting kindergarten. And the third reason uh, is that this is sort of an internationally accepted time of evaluation. So by standardizing at five, it allows us to compare our results to um, places not just across the country, but across the world. So we realized what we wanted was standardized outcome measurement for our patients, um, but we needed to make that work in the real world. And as anyone who's tried to implement a system has ever figured out, like there's reasons this doesn't happen already. And figuring out what those reasons are and how to overcome them, in my opinion, is one of the great strengths of using quality improvement methods. So we did some baseline data to see how we were doing. And when we started this work in 2020, 16% of kids were getting uh, aesthetic uh, assessments of photographs. And our goal was above 85%. Speech outcomes, we had about 33% of kids getting a speech assessment before starting school, um, mm -hmm. well below our target of 85. And we really uh, ref didn't have any processes in place to assess their dental or occlusal outcomes at this age, simply because it hadn't been something our, our team had looked at rigorously before. And so we realized we were starting with a blank template, but also with no processes in place. So. One of the things we did as a team is begin with uh, what I call on the research side, qualitative research. Um, but in quality improvement uh, and my other hat, I just call walking the line. So we talked to providers who were living in the cleft clinic and we said, why aren't we doing standardized measurement of our outcomes every day? What are the barriers to that? And do you think this is a good idea? Like if we tried to do this, what would make it feasible or uh, make it helpful? Um, and here, shown here are some of the key findings we got out of that. One of the things we learned um, was around the evidence strength and quality. And we realized that the providers in our clinic viewed standardized outcome measurement really as the gold standard and believed that care should be delivered according to those standards. So it showed us that the providers in our clinic were very supportive of these measures. And it also told us that we should really focus on validated outcome measures so that this like their belief that this is the right way to do it would be supported when they looked at what we were measuring as opposed to what other people were measuring. And I think that's very local dependent. So you could have gotten a different group of providers who might have said, you know, we really have our like personal things we want to measure and we realize they're not validated and we're okay with that. So this is where walking the line and understanding what your, your team want uh, helps guide the project. We also saw uh, that providers really preferred consistent systematic approaches to completing their evaluations. Um, and so that led us to focus on developing standardized processes and standardized templates. Again, if providers had told us, you know, they really like the one-offs, they like their clinic to be perfect for them, realizing someone else's clinic would be different, it would have changed how we implemented. it. Um, and then uh, providers were very clear that they saw complexity as an issue. Um, they could foresee numerous uh, barriers to standardized outcome measurement, and we got a long list. People were really, they were like, this could be a problem, and this could be a problem. And for those of us who do quality improvement, like, we're used to that, right? So we just sort of took that list, and we said, okay, this is a great place for us to do plan, do, study, act cycles. Small tests of change to, like, slowly get at each one of these problems, um, realizing that some uh, barriers may be insurmountable, but some things we may learn and find new ways. So we took this learning um, and developed uh, what I call an implementation strategy. And what that, mean, what that means in real life is it was a sort of a formal plan. A couple of the things in that strategy were just go do. So we knew that we needed to provide brief educational sessions to the providers and staff about standardized measurement and what we were trying to do so they could be part of the process. We also realized that creating a patient registry was sort of foundational to this work. And so we just went and made it happen. But then we did a lot of plan, do, study, act cycles or PDSA cycles, specifically around improving patient recall and streamlining uh, the processes in clinic to make it smoother, make it faster, uh, reduce the friction. Um, and then uh, realizing the importance of leadership uh, and um, materials for training to keep things going over the long term. 
we developed a formal implementation blueprint to really help folks. Um, we also chose metrics that would be helpful. So we measured penetration of standardized outcome measurement, which was the proportion of all the five-year-old children in our clinic for whom the measures were collected. And we measured that with run charts, um, which I think is sort of the, the best tool for measuring change as you go. Um, and then we had a balancing measure of acceptability. I think we all realize that if you bring enough artillery to a problem, <laughs> you can beat anything, but it may not be sustainable and it may not be acceptable. And so our balancing metric was, is the system we develop acceptable to providers? And fortunately, there's a really nice me validated measure of that that we were able to use. So what did it look like on the ground? Um, we The brief educational sessions <laughs> for providers and staff were held during the existing staff meetings each month. They were usually five or 10 minutes. And we really highlighted the benefits of standardized outcome measurement, knowing that these were the things that got people excited about the work and made them want to participate. Um, and we also discussed the results of the team's effort. We looked at the PDSA cycles each month, be like, what did we try? How did it go? Let's sort of talk about uh, our observations as it went down and figure out do we adapt it, do we adopt it, um, or do we uh, <clears throat> abandon it? We then created a patient registry, which I'll talk about in detail in a few minutes, uh, that included all of the patients with cleft lip or palate treated by our team. We went back 10 years. We started this work in 2020, so we went back 10 years. Um, and we developed processes to continuously update because we wanted to measure outcomes. And so we made a system so that all the outcome measurements we did in clinic fed into this system so that at any point in time, we can look at any provider's patients at any age group and any subgroup and sort of say, here's how your kid's doing. Here are their speech outcomes. Here are their aesthetic outcomes. Um, we realized that measuring the outcomes was why we were developing. And so we built those into our registry. The plan do study act cycles really uh, had two key focuses. The first one was with the scheduling staff and clinic. And I think that really shows like sense of how broad this was. It wasn't just one specialty. It was uh, four specialties. Uh, it wasn't just um, the clinic staff. It was the back office staff with our schedulers. Um, it was the front office staff uh, where patients were coming in. Uh, a couple of the PDSA cycles, just to give you an idea of what we were doing. Um, <clears throat> we had this plan of if every three months we, we gave the clinic coordinators a list of all the kids who were five and needed to be recalled because they hadn't been recalled already, maybe those lists would be helpful for getting folks in. Maybe these are kids who dropped off. Um, so we sent the list to our team coordinators. 55% of the patients that we gave them the first time we did this got scheduled. 45 did not. Uh, those eight patients were unable to be contacted. We did learn in this process uh, that many of the patients had moved away and that was really helpful because we realized they were in our registry. We thought they were active patients, but now that we knew they had moved away, we just updated them in our registry. So we weren't trying to contact them every time we were bringing them in for recall. So it was like a really helpful, I think when we studied it, we realized there's like a back and forth of we would generate this list for our team coordinators. And I'm looking at our coordinator now and she remembers this. Um, and she would say, here are the ones we reached, but these are the ones that have moved and should really be sort of marked as, as you know moved out of the area. Um, and then um, uh, it led to many of the patients who'd sort of fallen off the grid getting reconnected. Um, and after sort of iterating that and figuring out the right frequency of doing it and the right range, we adopted that over a couple of cycles. Um, we did do ramps, but I'm not going to show all those just for time. Um, we then worked with our social work team. Um, we said, what about these families who like we couldn't contact? We don't want them to be like abandoned, to be left out of the system. And so our social worker, we gave our social worker the list of these families and they work with uh, their uh, multitude of resources uh, to try to find these kids. So the first time we did it, we gave them those eight kids we couldn't contact. Um, they were able to get a hold of three of them. So uh, we were like, wow, this is really helpful. These are families who've fallen off the grid, life events have happened. Um, and often those kids had a lot of needs they have been out of the system for many years and they really did need to get recalled and they needed intervention so they could start kindergarten on time uh, and prepared. And so it also really brought our social work and our behavioral health team into the effort 
Um, it made it more of a multidisciplinary activity. Um, and I think as someone who often tried to find these folks uh, without success, I was worried it would be exhausting and the social worker would be like, don't ever do this, it's not worth it. Um, they were actually happy to do it. And uh, I think we ran this once and the social worker's like, yeah, just give me the list, I'm happy to do it. And I think it shows how helpful these resources are. Um, particularly, I know as an institution, we've gone to making social work more available for many of our clinics. And those folks have an amazing skill set. So I really encourage folks to work with them. Um, one of the efforts uh, led by our orthodontic team was the RU5 campaign. Um, they realized that there were a lot of five-year-olds coming in for speech visits or surgeon visits who needed outcome measurement in orthodontics or something else. And they said, what if we just grab these patients while they're here? And so the way that worked out was that the ortho assistants would review the clinic list uh, during uh, each morning during the huddle. Um, they did this for a month. And what they found was that each week they'd identify kind of one to three folks who needed the outcome assessment, but the family either no-showed or declined to come in for sort of a more formal assessment. And we got those kids in, got the measurements on them, um, and sort of like, adopted that uh, after a series of PDSAs to sort of figure out the right frequency and the right age to grab folks. I um, mean, our orthodontic assistants are sitting over here and they did a lot of work to make this work to really, uh, I think, find the patients when they were coming in a clinic and adjust the right time, approach families and get these things done. Uh, we also worked with our clinic staff because one of the other concerns was you're, you're measuring so much. This is going to add like two hours to our clinic. It's never going to work. Um, and so what we worked is like, well, let's do PDSA cycles. How can we kind of streamline this effort? How can we make it easier? Um, one of the uh, PDSA cycles we did was around like, what's the right age? Because what we found is that um, kids who were almost five, like four and a half, five, were just incredibly exhausting. You couldn't get them to do it. But uh, if you took those kids and sort of began to expose them to the, took them to the photograph room, um, had them like practice showing you in their mouth, then when they came back for their next clinic visit three months later, they were a little more primed and ready to do it. And so there was a lot of uh, PDSA cycles around how do we op optimize collection of these things to make it easy when the time comes. Um, one of the other things we did is we realized we were um, often, it wasn't that it was taking so long, we just weren't doing it. So uh, we realized that we'd have a kid who didn't have things measured and we were like, but they were just in to our orthodontic clinic. Why did we not get these things? And we realized we as a team weren't, hadn't systematized yet. We hadn't thought about doing it all the time. And so one of our PDSA cycles, the plan was to label all the five-year-old patients uh, the same way that said, this is a five-year-old cleft team evaluation so that the MAs, the orthodontic assistants, everyone who saw that patient knew five-year-old team assessment, let's get those measures on this kid today. Uh, and it required in, in the due side, the team coordinator to go backwards six months and relabel all those old visits uh, and then to standardize the process going forward. Um, but over a period of uh, about three months, it led to a rapid increase in the collection of orthodontic records by our team. Um, it really helped them sort of make it part of how they do every five-year-old visit and going from 33 to 80%. Um, and that was adopted. It kind of became the standard workflow. It also got um, put into the training processes. So now when new orthodontic assistants come in, they sort of know this is what happens out of five-year-old visit which I think is key for locking in benefits. Um, we also developed a formal implementation plan uh, which detailed the expectations of the clinical team leader. And I think one of the things I've been so blessed working in our cleft center, uh, I don't think you can do quality improvement work in any clinical setting if your leaders in the clinical environment are not supportive and willing to tell people to participate uh, to showcase the work um, and to really engender support at the ground level. And the leads for each of our clinical teams did that throughout this process. And I think having a blueprint for them so that they could see how all this fit in with everything else they were doing was helpful. Um, incredibly successful over the long term. So we started this work in 2020. Um, over a two year period, we increased uh, the proportion of uh, kids getting aesthetic assessments from 16 to 91%. Uh, 
we increased the proportion of children getting speech assessments from 33 to 92%. We increased the proportion of children getting uh, dental assessments from zero to 84%. Um, and we've maintained these um, over the uh, past year and a half to two years. So um, it took a lot of time, a lot of cycles, um, but with the right support, um, we were able to do it. At, uh, at several points along the way, we did these acceptability surveys. This is the one from the last end. So we gave this four question survey to the staff and the providers, realizing that lots of people are involved. And we said, does the current process for outcome measurement meet with my your approval? And you can see that uh, um, all the respondents either agreed or strongly agreed. They found it appealing, um, they liked it, and they welcomed it. So really broad support for this, uh, which I think is also probably explains why we were so fortunate. I think if we'd have found it wasn't acceptable, we would have gotten more resistance. Um, for those doing quality improvement work, uh, this acceptability uh, uh, questionnaire is, in, is a great, quick, validated measure that uh, is really helpful. So uh, in conclusion, we found the collection of these measures uh, was feasible and acceptable, and that the implementation strategy that addressed the known barriers really led to improvement using those methods. I think uh, a huge amount of work over uh, two years um, but a lot of success. We did have a key driver that led us along the way. This is the final version of that. I don't think you can talk about QI if you're not going to show your key driver. Um, but uh, there were so many iterations um, and uh, it's shown here beautifully on it as a diagram. But I remember when I got here seven years ago and Patricia Beals, our orthodontic lead, and I sat on a giant whiteboard and sketched out the first version of this. So it iterates. Um, act two. So, uh, now we're going to switch gears a bit and talk about some of the other work we've done. One of them was integrating our registry um, into the EHR. And uh, this work, really, we followed the EHRQ process for registry development, which is a very robust and helpful iterative process. I say that iterative to get registries that can support your work. Um, our initial objective was just to understand the clinical services our team delivered. How many patients were we seeing? This was a question we were constantly getting asked, particularly when it came to budget season or when we needed resources and we didn't know. We didn't have great ways to do that. Um, uh, obviously, I'm a surgeon, so I wanted to know what procedures are we performing? What are we doing? Um, what, uh, where should we focus our efforts? So we built this re uh, registry note directly into the electronic health record, which was very simple. Some simple information about their cleft type, some simple information about uh, the type of surgery they received. And then we got this great dashboard, which uh, I know for the folks here, uh, they're used to seeing these great Power BI dashboards that allowed us to understand, here's the care we're getting. Uh, we then iterated uh, that to support our QA and QI work. So we said, what's our rate of readmission and what is our fistula rate? Our fistula is basically wound separation after palate repair. We added those elements for a plastic surgery clinic note, very simple sort of yes, no check boxes. Um, the IT change was easy. Uh, what really made it work was that all the surgeons and all the PAs who do see these patients and follow up agreed, we're gonna document this every time we write one of these notes so that we can track our outcomes. And I think that buy-in is key. You can put anything you want in an electronic note. <laughs> People don't check the boxes you don't get any data. Um, and so uh, it's really, you know, the electronic note made it easy. The buy-in um, from the clinical, the clinicians who said this is important and we're gonna spend the time to make sure we do it all the time is what led to success. Um, we then iterated a second time and said, let's use the registry to facilitate research activities, um, both identifying patients for studies and completing data collection. Um, we first started this with a very large uh, multi-site study uh, looking at outcomes of cleft palate repair. Um, and so in that registry note, uh, if you said you were doing a palate repair, you would then say, yeah, I have patients on this study. And we took this giant two-page paper note and put it all in the registry. So the clinicians could really complete this at point of care. Um, and it was a huge step forward for us because we could capture the data in real time rather than retrospective. 
we had clinicians entering the data who like knew what these measurements were supposed to be. So we didn't have the crosstalk uh, with research personnel. Um, and in the end, this work really led, supported our operations, supported our quality work, supported our research work. Um, so I think I think these registries are incredibly helpful tools um, for for supporting the work you do with your patients, particularly if you follow them over time. So last act here, uh, you can see it's a busy, the cleft center is just ripe with uh, quality work and I just feel like I'm fortunate to present what they're doing. Um, this is the uh, home monitoring program for infants with cleft palate. Um, it has been driven really by Megan Halverson, who's our cleft team uh, nurse and coordinator lead, um, but also supported by Jessica Williams, uh, one of our speech and feeding specialists, and Jeanette Mizan, one of our uh, social workers on the team. So children with cleft palate struggle with feeding and weight gain. And the reason for that is that the cleft of the palate makes it impossible to generate the suction you need to breastfeed or use a regular bottle. Um, and so there are lots of adaptive bottles, um, but figuring out how to use them is actually quite challenging. Um, as many of the pediatricians in the room will know, it's not an, uncommon to see kids needing feeding tubes um, uh, with a cleft palate to try to get the caloric intake they need. And all uh, too frequently, what we see is growth charts like this in clinic, where a child is born uh, right uh, you know, with a normal uh, weight, um, but over the first few weeks and months, they just slowly drift until they're malnourished. Um, and in fact, several larger studies have shown that the malnutrition rate in children with cleft palate is around 20%. Uh, and this is, uh, this is at established clinics. Uh, the Washington data is from Seattle Children. So this is a robust center. Um, and we struggle. Kids come from a long distance uh, to see our team, which makes it harder to get the feeding therapy to address that. Um, and so we stole a stole an idea, to be honest. Uh, there's this uh, CHAMP program for hypoplastic left heart to allow folks to uh, report symptoms. It's been shown to reduce mortality in that population. And so we took that idea and linked it with the amazing experience here at PCH and home monitoring. Um, to create the Ignite program, where um, we deliver a scale at the first visit, families submit weekly weights along with feeding reports, and then uh, our uh, providers review those weights on a weekly basis. And if things look great, um, then we send a, a secure message, keep it up. If there are problems, and it's usually a phone call and either simple troubleshooting like, oh, your kid's they were sick this week. Okay, that explains things. Or, oh, feeding's really the session, feeding session's taking an hour. Let's get you in there to see our feeding therapist to see if we can work through that to make it more efficient. Um, what we well, we looked at this program after we've been running it for six months, and we had a dramatic reduction in the incidence of malnutrition um, by 26%. And we achieved that uh, in that early period by identification and treatment of feeding concerns early in the process. Um, and it allowed us to provide timely delivery of lip repair and palate repair at later infants. We also found that being able to check weights remotely led to fewer visits in clinic with our speech pathologists. And so we reduced in-person visits by 20% over this period. Um, I, I hope that we've also reduced caregivers' anxiety you know, this positive feedback of you're doing a great job, your kids get greening weight like we'd expect. Hopefully that provides all of the data still so think early for that. Um, I know that's kind of a quick go. Uh, final thoughts, a great team uh, and a vision that inspires everyone and a lot of hard work can, can produce results um, and hopefully quality improvement, I think offers tools and knowledge to support the change. Um, I always tell folks to steal ideas shamelessly. Uh, do provide credit uh, because that's important. But um, I, I think all the ideas I've ever had, I just I stole from other people, uh, and it's worked out so well. Uh, and they've been pretty happy. So uh, an amazing team here um, that I really feel like needs to be recognized. Uh, so multidisciplinary. Um, hopefully that's helpful as a picture of sort of how you can apply QI methods um, in your own clinic uh, setting. Thank you.
Thank you, Tom. Uh, great job highlighting just the tremendous efforts of you and your team. Um, hopefully what people, what came across is this doesn't just happen by chance. This is very purposeful, kind of slow drumbeat, continue to, to chip away. So thank you very much. Um, up next, we have our overall first place winner um, for this year's uh, submitted abstracts for Equality Day. Uh, we have two of our categorical residents, Dr. Jacob uh, Fontafal Murphy and Dr. Rasa Tiana are here to present uh, again, another very well-designed longitudinal kind of long effort, but really big impact project that has happened at Phoenix Children's over the past couple of years. Welcome. Thank you guys for inviting me to come and talk. Um, my name is Jacob. I'm one of the second year pediatric residents here at Phoenix Children's. Um, and I wanted to present our project that we've been working on in the general pediatric clinic. Um, our question was, do they really have a drug allergy? And we wanted to focus on our patient population with penicillin allergy labels in their chart um, and whether or not those allergies are real allergies or whether they can be delabeled um, with the help of our allergy clinic here on campus. Um, as you can see, there are a lot of people who helped with this. We have a very large clinic um, with about 40 residents um, and plenty of other physicians and staff members. Um, so I kind of wanted to review my objectives and uh, talk a little bit about penicillin allergy labels um, and then discuss the PDSA cycles that we went through in our clinic um, and then Dr. Tiano is also going to talk about the perspective from the allergy clinic um, when we send our kids to get uh, allergy testing for uh, penicillin class antibiotics. So when we started this project, um, we found lots of data that suggested about 10% of the U.S. population has a penicillin class antibiotic allergy label in their chart. But 90% of those people actually tolerate penicillin antibiotics. So that is a huge area for improvement. Um, and so when, when we talk about delabeling a patient um, and what happens when they do have a penicillin allergy label, we've seen patients get a lot more other antibiotics, including you know, more broad spectrum antibiotics that are supposed to be more reserved for uh, other uh, other infections, um, they are less effective often um, and they lead to higher antibiotic resistance. Um, so when our kids get vancomycin or clindamycin instead of a penicillin to treat something that should, uh, should go away with the penicillin, um, we get more MRSA, more VRE, more C. diff infections. Um, and even one paper suggested that surgical site infections are about 50% higher um, when we don't use the right antibiotic to treat these infections. Um, there's also a financial cost, both to the health system and to our patients. Um, the, the alternative antibiotics are more expensive. Um, a few studies found around $600 per hospital admission um, is extra cost to the patient when they can't use a penicillin antibiotic. Um, and when we're able to delabel these patients, um, the largest study we found showed a reduction in almost $2,000 um, per patient per year um, when, when they're hospitalized and we delabel them. So our aims for this study were to refer over 70% of our patients with a penicillin allergy to the allergy specialists. Um, and this is our process measure. So this is what we're going to measure throughout the study. And then our outcome measure was to reduce the percentage of penicillin allergy labels in our clinic uh, by 50%. Um, so our first PDSA cycle was in uh, 2021. Um, Pre-intervention, our local prevalence was about 7%, um, which is just under that 10% um, for the general US population. And we had about 17% of patients uh, with a referral to an allergist, 
and about three or nine percent of those who actually had an appointment already set up with allergy. Um, during our first PDSA cycle, we implemented a few different uh, things. First is the Quad AI handout, which I'll have a picture of. Um, and we provided this to all of our uh, clinical staff to help them understand what penicillin energy labels were, how we might be able to delabel them in the clinic. Um, and then we also worked with IT to help create a delabeling visit type. So when you go and refer a patient to the allergy clinic, there's actually a drop down section where you can choose that this patient is going to the allergy clinic to be delabeled or to have the drug testing um, in case they can be delabeled. Um, and the third was to work with our MAs and our other staff um, in the clinic to help add uh, to the workflow of identifying these patients, because that was one of the things that we struggled with in the beginning, was trying to identify which patients actually had the allergy and helping our providers or reminding our providers during a hectic visit, as we all know they can be in the general clinic, um, that this is something we needed to remind ourselves about. Um, so we saw that uh, we had over 50% of our patients after the first year with referrals to an allergist, um, and about 25% of them had actual visits to see the allergist. Um, so this is the quad AI handout that I was talking about. So this is for um, our clinical staff, and it kind of goes over the uh, background information and then what you should be asking during your visits. Um, to help determine whether the patient can be delabeled in the PCP clinic or whether you need to refer them to the allergist. Um, our second PDSA cycle was in 2022, um, and we started with around 50% of our patients having referrals to allergists. Um, our interventions included a, an, an algorithm that we created for our providers to help them either delabel them in clinic or decide when to send them to the allergist. Um, and then we also got a new dashboard for data reporting, um, which was very helpful. And then we trialed um, sending daily emails to the clinical staff of the clinic to help uh, identify those patients before they even showed up for clinic that day. Um, and then one of the other interventions we tried was uh, adding a flag to the patient's room um, to identify those patients with drug allergies. So it was something that the provider saw immediately before walking into the room, kind of gave them that extra reminder. Um, with these interventions, we saw an increase to 63% of our patients with penicillin allergies getting referrals um, to the allergist. This is one of the algorithms that we provided to our providers um, to show them how to delabel a patient if it was found that that was appropriate to do in the clinic. Um, and then we also showed them how to set up an appointment with the allergist. Um, and these were added to um, one of our clinical resource binders that our staff can use to uh, help take care of patients. Um, and so this shows our prevalence in uh, uh, penicillin allergies between our beginning 2021 um, and February of 2024. Um, and we saw a drop from 7% um, down to 4.4, and then finally down to about 4% of our patients now in the clinic uh, have penicillin allergies, which is much lower than the national average of 10%. Um, and so our third PDSA cycle was um, very interesting because there were things that we did not like from the second one um, that include sending those daily emails. We ran into some trouble with identifying specific uh, providers who were taking care of those patients. Um, it was unfortunate we couldn't uh, we couldn't specify the email to go to just the provider who was taking care of that patient. And so even if you weren't in clinic that day, um, you still got an email with the clinic patients that day um, who were who had penicillin allergies. So that was 
quite difficult um, for our clinicians to keep up with. Um, and then we also noticed that it was hard for our medical assistants to uh, keep posting those signs on the doors um, to give that uh, notification to the provider right before walking in. Um, and then during this time, we also uh, added an end of visit summary to our notes to help patients um, actually make it to the allergy clinic after the referral was made. Um, and so at the end of our study, we were approaching about 70% um, referral rate, and we did reach that a few times during, um, during the study. And like I said, our prevalence was down to 4% by the end. This is what our end of visit uh, summary looked like that we added to our notes. Um, again, it's one of those checkbox things. And so you have to uh, help your clinical staff to actually fill out this. You have to remind them so that you can get data from it. Um, so in conclusion, we referred about 70% of our patients um, and we were really close to that reduction of 50%. Um, and we're hoping as we continue to delabel patients in the clinic that we're able to make it down to that 3.5% prevalence. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, input and excitement about this work um, in other departments of the hospital. So we're hoping that um, people learn from this and are able to implement this in other clinics and in the hospital when patients are inpatient as well. Um, we did have some limitations. You know, it's a, sm it's a small clinic compared to the total population that we see here at the hospital. Um, and we see a lot of complex patients in our general pediatric clinic, as do most clinics here. And so finding time to just discuss a penicillin allergy when someone's got 12 specialists that they're following with and you going through each one, making sure that they go, is it really, do you really wanna send them to a 13th specialist who is going to test them? Um, and then with all QI, you know, balancing what works for some parts of the clinical staff, what doesn't work for others, um, and finding the, the right mix of doing just enough without doing too much. And then I have a list of references here for you. Um, and then Dr. Rossettiano is gonna give us a little talk about the allergy side of things, what happens when our patients actually go for allergy testing. All right, got it. Third part of the presentation. Um, I'm Rasa. I think I've met most of you in here. Um, my part of the presentation will be focused on really the impact that QI has to make a big difference in our community. So this project dovetailed very nicely with the PCH residency QI project, and it's a project that really came off of that. And it was focused on the safety and efficacy of oral antibiotic drug challenges in children five years and younger. And the reason we picked this age group is, as we all know, the five-year age is very challenging, five going on 15. Um, so it's difficult to have these patients share their experiences with drug allergy. It's difficult for them to say, my throat feels itchy, I have a rash, I feel ill. And really the sooner that we're able to delabel patients, the more all of those impacts are able to have, which is why we focus on this age group. Okay, so this is just, Going based off of what um, Dr. Murphy was saying, really the impact that QI can have in the day to day. So this is kind of a run chart of how the three phases have made an impact. So I just want to bring your attention to really the fourth box that happened around October of 2021, where that was when the uh, PCH team really had the collaboration with the Division of Allergy. And Dr. Ruckison, my mentor, is here. So you can see there was a big jump there. And then there was a second big jump um, after November of 2022, when we really showed the delabeling process to our providers. Just like Dr. Sitzman said, you really have to get the buy-in of all of your clinical staff. And we really saw a big jump after we were able to train our clinical staff on how to delabel properly and refer properly. So our study design, so um, we've really focused between uh, 2020, 2020 and 2023, and our there was 277 antibiotic challenges completed during that time, and 89 of those were under the uh, less than five-year-old age group, so a pretty significant amount, about one-third. 
These were the most top categories of drug allergy delabeling that were tested, and amoxicillin was 84% of the population. Again, because of the collaboration with the um, pediatric residency QI project, but you can see cephalosporins, Bactrim, Augmentin, and azithromycin were also delabeled. So just like Dr. Murphy mentioned, 64% with penicillin allergies were patients that were addressed in their clinics and all those patients were referred to allergy. Of course, there were some barriers. There's limitations that, you know, we have to have availability to delabel these patients. They need to come to their appointment. There is some anxiety and trepidation with families because they had a very scary experience when their child had a drug reaction. So there needs to be a lot of education and discussions to have them trial um, a drug oral challenge again. So January 20 to Jan July of 2023, there was 325 oral challenges completed. All those were kind of the categories that I mentioned before, and 277 of them were antibiotic challenges. We stratified based off of the under five and over five age group, and you can see that the under five age group had a 95% pass rate, which is a very high pass rate, and that's 95% of patients were able to be delabeled. Overall, across all of the age groups, it was even higher at 96.8%. This was a similar finding, so there's no difference in significance between the under, I, under five and over five. I just, I put this slide in there because this was, this is the only kind of cross-sectional um, study that looks at 20 different studies for drug allergy testing. So this is like the most powerful study we have. And you can see our data at PCH is very much on par with national data across all 20 of these studies. So it just goes to show that it was replicated and that shows that um, our study was proven to be confirmatory. So again, it shows that oh, there was a 5% reaction rate for immediate and non-immediate across all these age groups, and there was a less than 1% for an immediate reaction to the drug allergy testing. This is very similar to what we found here at PCH. So the under five age group had an only 4% fail rate. Three of those patients had a mild cutaneous eruption treated with a Zyrtec or Benadryl and that resolved, and only one patient had a mild delayed cutaneous eruption of which it resolved on its own. Zero patients out of all those that were studied in the under, under five age group had any severe cutaneous or systemic involvement, what we would label as anaphylaxis. The over five age group had an even less of a fail rate at 3%, so only five of those 188 patients. So what does this really mean? And this is what this whole day is about, right? The impact that quality and QI projects can have for trainees, attendings, our whole um, academic institution as a whole. Really, this goes to show that prevalence of immediate and delayed cutaneous reactions is similar in patients less than five and adults. So even though we have a lot of um, kind of anxiety around testing patients that are younger, it would show the same safety and efficacy. And even children under five years old with the penicillin, penicillin allergy should have an oral challenge and should be referred to allergy. So with confidence, all the pediatricians in the room can really tell their patients that 95% of patients referred for an, oral for an oral challenge had no reaction at all, had, had very wide success. Thank you so much. Great job, um, really highlights the collaboration, not only among the local teams in the clinic, but then across um, PCMG. So uh, congratulations, very well done. Um, just wanna remind everyone that um, we have a full day of events. So please, I hope everyone can join us at uh, uh, 10.30 for our poster walk rounds. And then at 12 o'clock today, back in this room is our award ceremony uh, where we will have our 10 finalists provide uh, their presentations on their work and, and we're looking to see a good turnout there. Um, one more round of applause and then if we could have our presenters stay, we have certificates um, for you as well as your honorariums. Thank you, everybody.